okay, this is uh, Mike Rose. This is the essay I just went to the average by Mike Rose in 50 essays that I'm reading right now. So let me just begin. <clears throat> it took two buses to get to our, our Lady in Mercy. The first stop was deep in South Los Angeles and caught me at midpoint. The second drifted through neighborhoods with trees, parks, big lawns, and lots of flowers. The rides were long but were livened up by a group of South LA veterans whose parents also thought that Hope had set up shop at the, at the west end of the country. There was Christy Big Beggars, who at 16 was dealing and was according to a rumor of Tim as well. There was Bill Cobb and Johnny Gonzalez, grease pencil artists, ex ex extraordinary, who left uh, their brutal enhanced swells of Cobb and Johnny on the corrugated walls of the bus. bus. And then there was Tyrell Wilson. Tyrell was the coolest kid I knew. He ran the, dis the dozens like a metric halfback, laid down a rap that outrhymed and outpointed Cobb, whose, whose rap was good but not great, the curse of a moderately soulful kid trapped in white skin. But it was Cobb who would sneak a radio onto the bus and thus under road to patter with, with uh, Little Richard, uh, Fat Domino, Chuck Berry, The Coasters, and Enrique. Those mother-in-law, a awful woman who was sent from down below. Oh, and yeah. And so it was that Christy and Cobb and Johnny J and Tyra and I and assorted others picked up along the way past our days in the back of the bus. A funny mix brought together by geography and and parent and parental desire. Entrance to school brings with it forms and releases and assessments. Mercy relied on a series of tests, mostly the Stanford Binet for replacement, and somehow the results of my tests got confused with those of another student named Rose. The other Rose apparently didn't do very well, for I was placed in the vocab on the vocational track, a euphemism for the bottom level. Neither I, neither I nor my parents realized what this meant. We had no sense that business math Business math, typing, and English level D were dead ends. The current spate, spate of reports on the school criticizes parents for not involving themselves in the education of their children. But how would someone like Tommy Rose, with his two years of Indian schooling, know what to ask? And what sort of, ple uh, and what sort of pressure could an exhausted waitress supply? The error went undetected, and I remained in the vocational track for two years. What a place. My homeroom was supervised by Brother Drill, a troubled and unstable man who also taught freshman English. When his class grip drifted away from him, which was often, his voice would rise in paranoid accusations, and occasionally he would lose control and shake or smack us. I hadn't been there two months when one of his brisk face turning slaps had my glasses sliding down the aisle. Physical education was also pretty harsh. My teacher was a stubby ex-lineman who had played old-time pro ball in the Midwest. He routinely had us grabbing our ankles to receive his stinging paddle across our butts. He did that, he said, to make men of us. Rose, he bellowed on our first encounter, me standing geekly in line in my baggy shorts. Rose, what the hell kind of name is that? Indian, sir, I squeaked. Indian? Oh, Rose, do you know the sound of a bag of shit makes when it hits the wall? No, sir. What? Sophomore English was taught by Mr. Mitro Petro. He was a large, bejeweled man who managed to top the parking lot, lot at, the, at the Shrine Auditorium. He would crow and preen and list for us the stars he brushed against. We'd ask questions and glance knowingly and snicker, and all that fueled the poor guy to brag some more. Parking cars was his night job. He had little training in English, so his lesson plan for his day work had us reading the district's required text, Julius Caesar, uh, allowed for the semester. We'd finished the play way before the 20 weeks was up, so he'd have us switch parks again and again and start again. They'd sign the, the fastest guy in Mercy, muscling through St. Caesar to to the breathless squeals of Calvarina as interpreted by 
Steve Fuso, a surfer who owned the school's most envied panelled wagon. Week ten and Dave week ten and Dave and Steve would walk take on new roles as would all as as would we all and render a waterlogged Cassius and a Brutus that are beyond my powers of description. Spanish one, taken in the second year, fell into the hands of my of a new recruit. Mr Montez was a tiny man, slight, five foot six, at the most soft spoken and delicate. Spanish was a particularly rowdy class, and Mr. Montez was as prepared for it as a doily maker at a hammer throw. He would tap his pencil to a room in which Steve Fuso was propelling spitballs from the heavy lips in which Mike Dweets was taunting Billy Hawk, a half-Indian, half-Spanish reeds and quietly explosive boy. The, voc- the vocational track are at Our Lady of Mercy mixed kids travelling in from South Salt Lake, with South Bay surfers and a few Salves and, and Chicanos from the harbours of San Pedro. This was a dangerous miscellany. Surf, surface and hodads and South Central Blacks all, all ablaze to the metronomic tapping of Hector Montez's pet pencil. One day, Billy lost it. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw him strike out with his right arm and catch Dewey's across the neck. Quick as a spasm, Dewey's was out of his seat, scattering desks, cracking Billy on the side of the head right below the eye. Cindy and Fuse and others broke it up, but the room felt hot and close, close and naked. Mr. Monta's tenuous authority was finally ripped to threads, and I think everyone felt a little strange about that. The, the charade was over, and when it came down to it, I don't think any of the kids really wanted, to, wanted it to end this way. They had pushed and pushed and bullied their way into a freedom that both scared and embarrassed them. Students would float to the mark who sat. I and the others in the vocational classes were bobbing in pretty shallow water. Vocational education had aimed at increasing the economic opportunities of students who, did, who do not do well in our schools. Some serious programs succeeded in doing that, and through exceptional teachers, like Mr. Gross, in Horace's Compromise, students learned to develop hypotheses and troubleshoot, reason through a problem, and communicate effectively. The true job skills. The vocational track, however, is, all, is, is, is most often a place for those who are not just making it, a dumping ground for the disaffected. There were a few teachers who worked hard at education. Young brother Satori, for example, combined a stern voice with weekly quizzes to try to pass along to us a, a skeletal outline of world history. But mostly the teacher had no idea of how to engage the imaginations of us kids who were scuttling along at the bottom of the pond. And the teachers would have needed some invent- inventiveness, for, for none of us was groomed for the classroom. It wasn't just that I didn't know things. I didn't know how to simplify algebraic fractions. I couldn't identify different types of clauses, bungled Spanish translations, but that I had developed various faulty and inadequate ways of doing algebra and making sense of Spanish. Worse yet, the years of defensive turning out in elementary school had given me a way to escape quickly while seeming at least half alert. During my time in folk ed, I developed further into a mediocre student and a somnolent pro- problem sol- solver, and that affected the subjects I did have the wherewithal to handle. I detested Shakespeare. I got bored with history. My attention fl- flitted here and there. I fooled around in class and read my books indifferently. The intellectual equivalent of playing with your food. I did what I had to do to get by, and I did it with half a mind. But I did learn things about people and eventually came into my own social, into my own socially. I liked the vo- guys in voice ed. Growing up where I did, I understood and admired physical pe- prowess, and there was an abundance of muscle here. There was Dave Sinder, a sprinter and halfback of true quality. Dave's ability and his quick wit gave him a natural appeal, and he was welcome in any clique, so he always kept a little independent. He enjoyed acting the fool and could care less about studies, but he possessed a certain maturity and never caused the faculty much trouble. It was a testament to his independence that he, in, that he included me among his friends. 
I eventually went out for track, but that was no joke. Owing to the Latin alphabet and the death and the dearth of R's and S's, oh Snyder sat behind Rose and we started engaging one liners and became friends. There was Ted Richards, a much touted little league pitcher. He was chunky and had a baby face and came to Our Lady of Mercy as a seasoned street fighter. Ted was quick to laugh and had a and, and had a loud jolly laugh, but when he got angry, he'd he'd smile a little smile, the kind that simply raised the corner of the mouth a quarter of an inch. For those who knew, it was an eerie signal. Those who didn't found themselves in big trouble, for Ted was very quick. He loved to carry on what would come to call philosophy. Oh, philosophical discussion. What is courage? Does God exist? He also loved the words and enjoyed picking up big ones like sal salubrious and equivoc equivi equivoc equivocal and use them in our conversations, laughing and uh, laughing at himself as the world hits a chuck hole rolling off his tongue. Ted didn't do all that well in school. Baseball and parties and testing the courage he'd speculated about took his time. His textbooks were a grossy and field and stream. Whatever newspapers he had found in the bus, bus stop from the daily walk, walk, worker to, porno, to pornography. Conversations with uncles or hobos or businessmen he'd met in the coffee shop. The old man in the sea. With hindsight, I can see that Ted was developing into one of those rough hewn intellectuals whose sources are a mix of the learned and the uh, apocryphal, whose discussions are both both assured and sad. And then there was Ken Harvey. Ken was good-looking in a puffy way and had a full and oily duck tail, and was a car enthusiast, in, enthusiast a ho-dad. One day in, in religion class, he asked, he said a sentence that turned out, to be one of the most memorable of the hundreds of thousands I've heard in those both had ears. We were talking about the parable of talents, about achievement, working hard, doing the best you can do, blah, blah, blah. When the teacher ca called on the, on the rest of Ken Hawley for an opinion, Ken thought about it, but just for a second and said, with studied minimal effect, I just want to be average. That woke me up. Average? Who wants to be average? Then the athletes chimed in with the cliches that make you want to Larry laryngectomize them. And the and the exchange became a platitud oh my and the exchange became a platidunious melee. At the time I thought Ken's assertion was stupid and I wrote him off. But a sentence he states he has stayed with me all those years, and I think I am finally coming to understand this. Ken Harvey was grasping for air. School can be a tremendously dis disorientating place. No matter how bad the school, you're going to encounter notions that don't fit with the assumptions and beliefs that you grow up with. Maybe you'll, maybe you'll hear these those dis dissonant notions from teachers, maybe from the other students, and maybe you'll, you'll read them. You'll also be thrown in with all kinds of kids from all kinds of backgrounds, that, and that can be unsettling. This is especially true in places of rich ethnic and linguistic mix, like the LA Basin. You'll see a you'll you'll see a, a handful of students far excel you in courses that sound exotic and that are only in the curriculum of the elite: French, physics, trig trigonometry. And all this is happening while you're trying to shape an an identity. Your body is changing and your emotions are running wild. If you're a working class kid in the vocational track. The options you'll have to deal with, this will be con constrained in certain ways. You're defined by your school as slow. You're placed in a curriculum that isn't designed to liberate you, but to occupy you. Or if you're lucky, train you, though the training is for the work the society does not esteem. Other students are picking up the cues from your school and your curriculum and inter interacting with you in particular ways. If you're a kid like Ted Richard, you turn your back on all of this and you and let your mind roam where it may. But youngsters like Ted are rare. What Ken and so many others do is protect themselves from such suffocation, suffocating madness by taking on with a vengeance the identity implied in the vocational track. Reject the confusion and frustration by openly defining yourself as the common joke. 
champion the average, rely on your own good sense. Fuck this bullshit. Bullshit, of course, is everything you and the others. Fear is beyond you. Books, essays, tests, academic scrambling, complexity, scientific reasoning, philosophical inquiry. <laughs> the tragedy is that you have to twist a knife in your own grey matter to make this defence work. You'll have to shut down, have to reject intellectual stimuli or diffuse them with sarcasm, have to, have to cultivate stupidity, have to convert boredom from a melodate into a way of, of con confronting the world. Keep your vocabulary simple, act stoned when you're not, or act more stoned than you are. Flaunt ignorance, materialize your dreams. It's a powerful and effective defense. It neutralizes the insult and the frustration of being a vocational kid. And when, and when perfected, it drives teachers up the wall. A delightful secondary effect. But like all strong magic, it extracts a price. My own deliverance from the bulkhead world began with sophomore bio biology. Like students, college prep to vocational had to take biology. And unlike the, and, and unlike the other courses, the same person taught all sections. When teaching the vocational group, Brother Clint probably slowed down a bit or, remoted, or omitted a few of the fundamental biochemistry, but he used the same book or more, and more or less the same syllabus across the board. If one class got tough, he could get tougher. He was young and powerful and very handsome. The looks and physical strengths were high currency. No one gave him any trouble. I was pretty bad at the dissecting table, but the lectures and the textbook were interesting. Plastic overlays that with, with each turn page peeled away skin, then veins and muscle, then organs, down to the very bones that Brother Clint, pointer in hand, would tap out on our hanging skeleton. Dave Steiner was in big trouble, for the study of life, versus the living of it, was sticking in his craw. He worked out a code for a multiple choice exam. <laughs> he had poked me in the back once for the answer under A, twice for B, and so on. And when, and when he hit the right one, I look up to the ceiling as though I was lost in thought. Poke, cytoplasm, poke, poke, methane, poke, 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 William Harvey, poke, 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 it's let's of Langerhart. This didn't work out perfectly, but Dave passed the course and I mastered the dreamy look of a guy on a record jog jacket. And something else happened. Brother Clint puzzled over this blockhead kid who was racking up 98s and 99s on his tests. Checked the school records and discovered the error. He recommended that I begin that I begin my junior year in the college prep program. According to all I've read since, such a shift, as one report puts it, is virtually impossible. Kids at that level rarely cross tracks. The, the, the telling thing is how chancy both my placement into and exit from Bokeh was. Neither I nor my parents had anything to do to, to do with it. I lived in one world during spring semester, and when I came back to school in the fall, I was living in another. Switching to college prep was a mixed blessing. I was, an, I was an erratic student, I was undisciplined, and I hadn't caught on to the rules of the game. If I work hard in a class that didn't grab my fancy, I was also hopelessly behind in math. Chemistry was hard, toying with my chemistry set years before hadn't prepared me for the chemist's equations. Fortunately, the priest who taught both chemistry and second year algebra was also the school's athletic director. Membership on the track covered me. I knew I wouldn't get lower than a C US history. A C US history was taught pretty well, and I did okay. But civics was taken over by a football coach who had trouble reading the textbook aloud. And reading aloud was this, was the centerpiece of his pedal pedagogy. College prep at Mercy was certainly an improvement over the vocational program. At least it carried some status, but the social science curriculum was weak, and the mathematics and physical sciences were simply beyond me. I had a miserable quantitative background and ended up copying some assignments and and finessing the rest as best I could. Let me try to explain how it feels to see again and again with how how it feels to see again and again material you should once have learned but didn't. You were given a problem. It requires you to simplify algebraic fractions or to multiply expressions containing square roots. You know this pretty basic material because you've seen it for years. 
once a teacher took some time with you and you learned how to carry out those operations, simple versions anyway. But that was a year or two or more in the past and now, and, and these are more com complex versions. Now you're not sure. And this, you keep telling me, and this, you keep telling yourself is ninth or even eighth grade stuff. Next is a word problem. This is, this is, this is also old hat. The basic elements are as familiar as story characters, trains speeding so many miles per hour, or shadows of buildings angling so many degrees. Maybe you know enough, have sat, have, have sat through enough explanations to be able to begin setting up the problem. If one train is going this fast, or this shadow is really one line of a triangle, then let's see, how did Jones do this? Hmm, no, no, that won't work. Your attention wavers. You wonder about other things, like football game, a dance, that cute new checker at the market. You try to focus on the problem again. You scribble on paper for a while, but the tension wins out and your attention fit, flips elsewhere. You crumple the paper and, and begin daydreaming to ease the frustration. The particulars will vary, but in essence, this is what a number of students go through, especially those in so-called remed remedial class colossus. They open their textbooks and see once again the familiar and, and, and pe impenetrable formulas and diagrams and terms that have stumped them for years. There is no, exci there is no excitement here. No excitement. Regardless of what the teacher says, this is not a new challenge. There is rather embarrassment and frustration, not surprisingly, some anger in being reminded once again of long-standing inadequacies. Long-standing inadequacies. No wonder so many students finally attribute their different difficulties to something inborn, organic. That part of my brain just doesn't work. Given the troubling histories, many of these students have it's, mir it's miraculous that any of them can lift a shroud of hopelessness sufficiently to make deliverance from these classes possible. Through this entire period, my father's health was deteriorating with cruel momentum. His art terror progressed to the point where a simple nick on his skin, shin wouldn't heal. Eventually, it ulcerated and widened. widened. Low Minton would, would come by daily to change the dressing. We tried renting an oscillating bed, which was which we placed in the front room, to force blood through the construct the construct the constricted arter arteries in my father's legs. The bed hummed through the night, moving in place to ward off the in the inevitable. They also continu they also continued to spread, and the doctors finally had to amputate. My grandfather had lost his leg in a stockyard accident, and now. Father, too, was crippled. His conveyance was slow but steady, and the doctors placed him in the Santa Monica Re Rehabilitation Center, a sun-bleached building that opened out in, onto the warm spray of the Pacific. The place gave him some strength and some color and some training in walking with, a, with, an, art, with an artificial leg. He did pretty well for a year, year or so until he slipped and broke his hip. He was confined to a wheelchair after that, and the confinement contributed to the diminishing of his body and spirit. I'm holding a picture of him. He's sitting in his wheelchair, smiling at the camera. The smile appeared forced, unsteady, seems to wait, quaver, though it is frozen in silver nitrates. He is in his mid-sixties and looks eighty. Late in my junior year, he had a stroke and never came back of the resulting coma. After that, I would, only, I would see him only in dreams, and to this day, that is how I join him. Sometimes the dreams are sad and grisly and, pr and primal. My, my father lying in bed, soaked with his separation, holding me, rocking me. Sometimes the, dream, the, the, the dreams bring him back to me. Healthy, him talking to me on an empty street, or buying some pictures to decorate our, to decorate our old house or transform some, somehow into someone's strong and adept tools in the physical. Jack McFarland couldn't have come into my life at a better time. My father was dead, and I had logged up too many years of scholastic indifference. Mr. McFarland had a, math, had, had a master's de degree from Columbia and decided at 26 
to find a little school and teach his heart out. He never took any credentialing credentialing courses, couldn't bear to, he said, so he had to find employment in a private system. He ended up at Our Lady at Mercy, teaching five sections of senior English. He was a beatnik who was born too late. His teeth were stained, he tucked his sorry tie in between the third and fourth buttons of the shirt, and his pants were chronic, chronically wrinkled. At first, we couldn't believe this guy, though he slept in his car. But within no time, he had us so, st- he had us so startled with work that we didn't much worry about where he slept or if he slept at all. We wrote three or four essays a month. We read a book every two or three weeks, starting with the Liad and ending up with the Hemingway. He gave us a quiz on the reading every other day. He brought a prep school curriculum to Mercy High. MacFarlane's lectures were crafted, and as he devel- and as he delivered them, he would pace the room, juggling a piece of chalk in his cupped hands, using it to scribble on the board the names of all the writers and philosophers and plays and novels he was weaving into his discussion. He asked questions often, raising everything from Zeno's paradox to the repeated last line of Frost stopping by woods on a snowy evening. He slowed and carefully built up our knowledge of Western intellectual history, with facts, with connections, with speculations. We learned about Greek philosophy, about Dante, the Elizabethan worldview, the age of the age of reason, existent, existentialism. He analyzed poems with us, had us reading sections from John C.R.E.'s How Does a Poem Mean, making a potentially difficult book accessible with his own explanations. We gave oral reports on poems C.R.E. didn't cover. We imitated the styles of Conrad, Hemingway, and Time magazine. We wrote and talked, wrote and talked. The man immersed us in language. Even MacFarlane's bobs were lit- literary. If Jim Fitz, Fitz, Fitzsimmons, hungover and irritable, tried to smart ass him, he'd rejoin with a flourish that would spark the indomitable Skip Mason, who lost his front teeth in a hapless tackle to flick his t- tongue through the gap and outline good chop, drawing out, out a single O in the in stinging indictment. Jack Marfarland, this tobacco-stained intellectual, brandished linguistic weapons of a kind that hadn't encountered before. He was this egghead, for God's sake, keeping some pretty difficult people in line. And from what I've heard, Mike Dewey's and Steve Fusco and all the notorious, notorious woke ed crowd settled down as well when McFarland took the podium. Though a lot of gals, guys growls in the, in the schoolyard, it just seemed that giving trouble to this particular teacher was a silly thing to do. Tom Fooley, not to mention assault, had no place in the world he was trying to create for us. And instinctively, everyone knew that. If nothing else, we all recognized MacFarlane's considerable intelligence and respected the hours he put into his work. It came to this. The troublemaker would look foolish rather than daring. Even Jim Fitzsimmons was reading on the road and turning his incipient alcoholism into literary ends. There were some lives that were already beyond Jack Farland's administrations, but mine was not. I started reading again as I hadn't seen since elementary school. I would go into our gloomy little bedroom or sit at the dinner table while on the television, Danny McShane was paralyzing Mr. Moto with the atomic prop and worked slowly back through his heart of darkness, trying to catch the words in Conrad's sentences. I certainly was not McFarland's best student. Most of the other guys in college prep, even my fellow slackers, had better backgrounds than I did. But I worked very hard, for for McFarland had hooked me. He tapped my old interest in reading and creating stories. He gave me a way to feel special by using my mind. And he provided a role model that wasn't shaped on physical progress alone. And something inside me I hadn't quite aware of responded to that. Jack McFarlane established a literacy club to borrow a phrase of, of Frank Smith's and invited me, invited all of us to join. There's been a great deal of research and speculation suggesting that the acknowledgement of school performance with its extreme, ex, 
intrinsic rewards, smiling faces, stars, numbers, grades, diminishes the intrinsic satisfaction children experience by engaging in reading or writing or problem solving. While it's certainly true that we've created an education system that encourages our best and brightest to become cynical grade collectors, and I in general have developed an, an obsession with evaluation and assessment, I must tell you that that Venel through though it, has, it may have been, I loved getting good grades from McFarland. I now know how subjective grades can be, and then they can, but then they came tucked into the back of essays like bits of scientific data, some sort of, of spectroscopic readout that said, objectively and publicly, that I had made something of value. I suppose I'd been me mediocre for too long, and enjoyed a public redefinition. And I suppose the, re the workings of my mind, such as they were, had been private for too long. My linguistic play moved into the world. These papers with their circled red B pluses and A minuses linked my mind to something outside it. I carried them around like a club emblem. One day in, this, one day in, in the December of my senior year, Mr. McFarland asked me, asked, asked me where I was going to go to college. I hadn't thought much about it. Many of, many of the students I teach today spend their last year in high school with a physics test in one hand and the Stanford catalog in the other, but I wasn't even aware of what entrance requirements were. My folks would say that they wanted me to go to college and be a doctor, and I, didn't, and I don't know how seriously I ever took that. It seemed a sweet thing today to say, a bit of supportive family chatter, like telling a gangly daughter she's graceful. The reality of higher education wasn't in my scheme of things. No one in the family had, had gone to college. Only two of my uncles had completed high school. I figured I'd get a night job and go to a local junior college because I knew that Steinder and company were going there to play ball. But I hadn't even prepared for that. When I finally said, I don't know, McFarland looked down at me. I was sitting in his office and said, listen, you can write. My grades stink. I had A's in biology and a handful of B's and a few English and social science classes. All the rest were C's, or worse. McFarland and I said I would do well in, in his class and lay down the law of doing well on the others. Still, the record for my first three years wouldn't have been acceptable, ex acceptable for any four-year school. To nobody's surprise, I was turned down flat by USC and UCLA. But Jack McFarland was on the case. He had received his bachelor's degree from Loyola University, so he made calls to old professors and talked to somebody in admissions and wrote me a strong letter. Loyola finally accepted me as a prob probationary student. I will be on trial for the first year, and if I did okay, I will be granted regular status. McFarland also intervened to give me a loan, for I could never have afforded a private college without it. Four more years of, of religion classes, four more years of boys at one school, girls and at another. But at least I was going to college. Amazing. In my last semester of high school, I elected a special English course fashioned by Mr. McC McFarland, and it was through this elective that there arose a mercy, a fledging literary. Art Mitz, the editor of the school newspaper and the very smart guy, was the kingpin. He was joined by me and by Mark Mark Denver, Deva, a quiet boy who wrote beautifully and who would die before he was 40. McFarland occasionally invited us to his apartment, and those visits became the high point of our apprenticeship. We'd clamp on our training wheels and drive to his salon. We lived in a cramped and cluttered place near the airport, tucked away in the kind of building that architectural critic Rainer Banham calls a dingbat. Books were all over, stacked, piled, tossed, and crated, underlined in dog-eared, well-worn and new. Cigarette ashes, crusted with coffee in sources, were spilling over the sides of motel ashtrays. The little, the little bedroom had, along two of its walls, bricks and boards loaded with notes, magazines, and oversized, oversized books. The kitchen joined the living room, and there was a stack of German papers under the sink. I had never seen anything like it. A great flophouse of language furnished by city lights and cafe le metro. 
I read every title. I flipped through paperbacks and scanned jackets and memorized names. Google fin fin Finnegan's Wake. Did did you Barnes, Jackson Pollock, A Coney Island of the Mind, F of Mattins Matt Mattison's American Renaissance, All Sorts of Feud, Troubled Sleep, Man Ray, The Education of Henry Adams, Richard Wright, Film of Art, William Butler Yeats, Margute Dorduras, Redburn, Exist in Hell, Capital. On the cover of Alan Fournier's The Wanderer was a was an Edward Gorey drawing of a young man on a road winding into dark trees. By the hot place by the hot plate sat a strange Kafka novel called America, in which an adolescent uh, hero crosses the Atlantic Atla Atlantic to find the nature theatre of Oklahoma. Art and Mark would be talking about a movie or the school newspaper, and I would be consuming my English teacher's library. It was heady stuff. I felt like a pop Warner athlete on steroids. Art, Mark, and I would buy stogies and, trang and, and triangulate from Mark Farman's apartment to the cinema, which now shows X-rated movies, but was then LA's premier, but but was then LA's premier art theater, and then to the musty. Cherokee bookstore in Hollywood to hobnob with beatnik homosexuals, smoking, drinking bourbon and cough coffee, and trying out awkward phrases that we'd glean from our mentor's bookshelves. I was happy and pre precocious, and a little scared as well, for Hollywood bo Boulevard was thick with a kind of decadence that was foreign to the south side. After the ch after the Chicoroki, we would head back to the security of of Mac of Mac MacFarlane's apartment, slap happy with hippie hipness. Let me be the first to admit that there was a good deal of ad of adolescent passion in this embrace of the advent grade. Self absorption, sexually charged pedantry, and an elevation of the odd and abandoned. Since still it was a time during which I absorbed an awful lot of information. Long lists of titles, images from expressionist Paintings, new wave shibboleths, snippets of philosophy, and names I read like Steve Fusco's misspellings. Goste, Nietzsche, Kilchrache. Sorry. Now this is hardly the stuff of deep understanding. But it was just, but it was an, an introduction, a phrasebook, a back there for, to a vocabulary of ideas. And I felt good at the time to know all these words. With hindsight, I realized how layered and important that knowledge was. And it enabled me to do things in the world. I could browse bohemian bookstores in far mysterious Hollywood. I could go to the cinema and see events through the lenses of European dictators. And most of all, I could share an evening, talk that talk, with Jack McFarland, the man I most admired at the time. Knowledge was becoming a bonding agent. Within a year or two, the persona of the dis disaffected hipster would prove too cynical, too alienated to last. But for a time, it was new and exciting. It provided a critical perspective on society, and it ended, allowed me to act as though I was living beyond the limiting boundaries of South Vermont. Oh man, thank you. For the same, yes.